The Conservative Party Conference, or CPC, is the official national conference hosted by the British Conservative or Tory Party, and last took place in Manchester between the 3rd and the 6th of October 2021. And there were some pretty funny things to come out of it, such as photos showing how the LGBT Conservatives were put under Section 28 at the conference. Section 28 of the 1988 Local Government Act was the series of horrific laws introduced by the Tories under Margaret Thatcher that prohibited local authorities, such as teachers, from even acknowledging the existence of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people on grounds that doing so would constitute the, quote, promotion of homosexuality, end quote. However, we also got to see that, whilst it might like to pretend otherwise, very little has actually changed inside the Conservative Party, with it being the very same hotbed of bigotry and intolerance as it was in the previous decades. Though before we can delve deeper into that, I just need to give a content warning for the following. Queerphobia, antisemitism, ableism, the Holocaust, and Nazi Germany. If you like our work and appreciate the research put into each video, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon. You can also support us by liking, commenting, and sharing our work on social media. Hi there, my name is Ethel Thurston, and today we'll be taking a look into the way in which anti-Semitism was used to promote transphobia at last year's Tory conference, a fact that, as of yet, seems to have gone completely unreported. Now, that's not to say the speaker received no criticism. Indeed, the following clip was heavily criticised for its queerphobia, having come from a panel debate at CPC21 titled, Are Conservatives Doomed? Specifically, the closing statement given by conservative journalist Ed West. It's a sign of how bad things are that some of the pushback against kind of this kind of madder trans agenda stuff, um, which, by the way, all teenagers are now getting brainwashed with, which is just happening, and I can see it ha happening now, um, was by using gender critical feminists as basically a human shield, because you know, there's no conservatives who will go out there and, and use a conservative argument against this. We have to use other progressives to fight it. Uh, I mean, that makes me very pessimistic. So there's a lot to consider here. We have the lie that gender-critical fascists are somehow either feminist or progressive. There's the way in which trans liberation is being equated with mental illness, which in turn is being used as an ableist pejorative. And there's the way in which Mr. West admits that the so-called gender-critical crowd really are just a front for their bigotry. A human shield, as he calls it. Indeed, this was the topic of discussion on Twitter, with trans people passing said video around as confirmation for what we already knew. But what really stuck out to me is Mr. West's claims regarding people being brainwashed into believing that they're LGBT+. This, of course, is not something new. Members of the LGBT plus community have always been accused of indoctrinating young minds, hence the introduction of legislation such as Section 28. Yet, in recent years, the focus has shifted towards trans people specifically, with trans people only really entering the public's consciousness in 2014, what is commonly known as the trans tipping point. The argument here is that young people are being targeted or even preyed upon, being made to think they're transgender, implying that trans people are either some new phenomenon, or that most of the people, particularly young people, who say they are trans, aren't all of which is incredibly transphobic. Yet it's important to note that any time someone runs around claiming that a group is being brainwashed, they're also claiming that a second group is out there doing the brainwashing. And whilst you might think people like Ed West would focus strictly on LGBT plus people as a self-perpetuating force, that has never been the case, as we can see in what he says less than a minute later. I mean, in some ways, this is a kind of battle between you know, like, the ruling class are basically international now. They don't really have, um, you know, the, the, the period of the great national loyalties is in huge decline. It has been since the time of the First World War. And there were just economic reasons to do that, to do the global English, to do with um, the internet, the global economy. Um, and so the nation thing becomes uh, a kind of, like, minority opinion. And that's why the Conservatives, you know, increasingly are more of a working class party. Um, but they are, you know, they are set against the kind of ruling class. And, and that's a very difficult agenda to pull off. So, you know, that's my basic thing is that you're fighting against like the most well-connected, the most well-educated. You go to any 
elite institution these days, including the top public schools, and you know they are woke. To use that horrible word. So we have a secretive and well-educated ruling class connected to the global economy who have been weakening national loyalty since around the time of the First World War, part of which is the promotion of the idea that trans and indeed other queer people exist. If this sounds uncomfortably familiar, it's because everything Ed West has just stated is a string of anti-Semitic dog whistles, many of which could have been pulled from Mein Kampf itself because the Nazis blamed Jewish people for what they argued was the apparent degradation of German society, something often labelled as cultural Bolshevism or cultural Marxism, during the interwar period. Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sex Research in Berlin was the world leader on the matter of understanding LGBT plus identities at the time, teaching same gender couples how to engage in safe sex, and even offering trans people early forms of HRT. Tragically, the institute was targeted when the Nazis rose to power, being raided for its literature which was then burned at public book burnings, whilst many of its service users were thrown into concentration camps under the Pink Triangle. Magnus Hirschfeld, himself a gay Jewish man, fled the country to France, where sadly he passed away due to a heart attack. He was later buried in Nice, France, where his motto, Through Science to Justice, was etched in Latin over his tomb because that is the context erased from history lessons and textbooks discussing the rise of the Nazis and their public book burnings. The Nazis weren't destroying any old book they disliked, they were systematically eradicating any materials which spoke about LGBT plus people as anything other than a disease upon humanity. Sadly, for the LGBT plus victims of the Holocaust, the horror for them didn't end with the Nazis, with many of the Pink Triangles who were freed from concentration camps being immediately imprisoned by the Allies for who they were. So in light of all this, it really shouldn't come as a surprise that, decades later, Western fascists would begin presenting emergent queer theory as a part of a Jewish conspiracy intended to weaken white Western civilization. A couple of terms they brought back during the 90s were cultural Bolshevism and cultural Marxism, terms which have become particularly prolific online. They were even used by fascist terrorist Anders Breivik in his 2011 manifesto, with him blaming the Frankfurt School for the rise of political correctness, introducing the concept by asking what happens to those who declare that, quote, homosexuality is morally wrong. End quote. The Frankfurt School was an academic institution first founded in Germany as a criticism of both fascism and Marxism-Leninism, but was later moved to America as many of its most prominent members fled the country during the period leading up to the Holocaust. Point is, the connection between general queerphobia and antisemitism is a well-documented phenomenon that scholars, particularly Jewish scholars, have known and written about for decades. And just like how much of the bigotry surrounding gay and bisexual people has been recycled as part of the trans hysteria, so too has this anti-Semitism, with popular voices in the gender-critical movement trying to forge a connection between Jewish folk and trans liberation. We even see similar language to that used by Ed West in books like those written by Helen Joyce when she talks about a global agenda in her book, Trans, when ideology meets reality, right before she goes on to name three Jewish investors as the people behind the curtain. So considering Ed West's position as a political journalist, I find it impossible to believe that he is not aware of the subtext present in what he's saying, especially considering his special interest in post-war history. He knows exactly what he's doing, and so do the vast majority of the people listening to that talk. And that's a fact that deserves to be called out, for everyone's sake. Though since we're here, and since Holocaust Remembrance Day just passed, it's worth discussing how the term postmodernism, as used by reactionary voices, such as Jordan Peterson, serve much the same function as cultural Bolshevism. In fact, cultural Bolshevism and postmodernism are often used interchangeably, being thrown out whenever a far-right bigot comes into contact with something they dislike. What's more is, a lot of the fascists who use their term in their propaganda tend to also blame the Frankfurt School 
for postmodernism. This is in spite of the fact that all of the Frankfurt School's main theorists were modernists, with some even warning against postmodernism. This once again demonstrates what I've long said about fascists. They don't need the language they use to make sense, they just need a big scary word to throw out whenever they want to accuse Jewish people of being the root of all evil, and not be chastised for it. Or at least, not to the same extent as if they just said what they meant. Bonus points if it's a word people might have heard of before, yet know virtually nothing about. It's the same situation regarding the term globalist, or indeed the usage of the word global, in the context of some shadow state seeking to undermine and destroy the nation, as seen earlier with both the global agenda and global economy. Fascist has so many terms that serve the same function since the longer fascists use any singular one, the more aware people become towards said usage. That's to say, a dog whistle only works so long as it retains deniability. That's also what makes terms like global and postmodern so enticing to fascists since they have pre-established real-life usage. We need to talk about certain things on a global scale, such as the economy, and postmodernism is a term that describes a set of very real social theories. This sadly means that fascists can always try to hide behind other people's usage of said terms, claiming that they can't be anti-Semitic unless we're saying that everyone using said terms are also being anti-Semitic. That's why it's important to be on the lookout for the context regarding some secretive order seeking to harm society, since it's that context that makes clear whether a statement is a genuine usage of a term, or if it's being used as a cover for something that is incredibly dangerous. And hopefully, that's something you'll be better equipped to spot now that you've had it explained to you. Though, if you'd like to find out more about the specific connection between the gender-critical ideology and anti-Semitism, I suggest checking out the Twitter account GC Antisemitism. Said account archives members of the gender-critical movement engaging in anti-Semitism, and learning about said talking points in that specific context can actually help you spot anti-Semitism elsewhere, as it changes surprisingly little between renditions. Now, if you appreciate what we do here and want to help out, please consider becoming one of our wonderful patrons who make all this possible. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following people. Matthew Kovac, Hannah Banghart, Gert Van Voorst, Cthulhu, Higgins the Seagull, and Flynn. And for myself, Adita and Levi, take care now.